Greetings everyone and welcome to this webinar. Today's topic is ISO 13485 Proposed Changes Part 1. I am Arta Lamani, the PECB organizer of this webinar and the guest for today is David Smart, PECB Certified Trainer and Managing Director of Smart ISO Systems slash Smart Mentoring. Please jot down any questions you may have during the webinar and bring them with you next Wednesday during part two of ISO 13485 proposed changes and David will answer to them then. However, if you have any other questions or concerns for David, you can send them through email and we will answer to them individually. Thank you for your cooperation. Please, David, you may start the presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world, and thank you very much very much for giving me uh, the opportunity to do this presentation and I hope you get something of interest out of it. So looking at the, the red box in the front you'll see this to the proposed changes. Now this is a bit unusual this this to. Normally there is only a this draft information standard but because there was this agreement this unusual step that is a this to and also the X is just there because they do not know exactly when it's going to be issued formally as a standard. So that's the reason for that. Now go on. <coughs> now, <coughs> this only applies to devices sold within the European Union which carry CE markings. Annex Z, the, the changes were made on the 2012 standard as a number of European countries objected to the inference that ISO 13485 and fair compliance to the medical device directive. To solve this problem, annexes at the beginning of the new standard have now been expanded to link the clauses of ISO 13485 to the medical di device directive. There are three main up annexes as follows. Annex ZA covers Directive 9342EC on medical devices. Annex ZB covers Directive 90-385EC on active implantable medical devices. And Annex C covers Directive 9879EC on intro vitro diagnostic medical devices. There was no contextual change to the standard. The forward was changed and Annex Z added to the front of the existing 2003 version. Now, I saw the new proposed version of 13485 is going in a diversion direction from ISO 9001. The proposed new standard is an interim measure to more closely align with the medical device directives which apply to the sales and distribution of medical devices within the EU countries. The new SL high level structure or 9001-2015 will not apply to this start. Traditionally, it has been closely followed the development of ISO 9001 but a split card and 13485 is aligning more with the MDD. However, some of the technical changes, technical changes adopted in ISO 9001 2015 will be going to be adopted. Now, unlike again 2015, the ISO 9001, the clause numbering system, the current numbering system will remain as eight clauses, not ten, as is now required in the 9001-2015 version standard. Again, it's a risk-based approach. In the proposed new standard, much more emphasis is placed on the risk. So you will constantly have to assess and justify your approach to the risk you are exposed to throughout the whole of the standard. Now this is similar to ISO 9001, but I feel Myself, having read both standards, there's a lot more emphasis actually on this risk-based approach with ISO 13485 than in 9000. Now, 
The projected issuing date, the latest information I have is the date to be issued for the final approved standard for use will be quarter one of 2016. I showed 2001 2015, again I'm just repeating the high level annex with 10 clauses rather than 8. The numbering system for uh, the, 20, the third version will keep the same clause number system as the 2012 version. Therefore, the high level clause number system that's in 9001 will not be adopted. The main changes to 13485, the draft information standard, this 2 has been issued for discussion. But as yet, no date to implement version 3 of this standard has been agreed. We will now go on to examine the proposed changes clause by clause. Now, you still have to keep a quality manual, again, unlike 9001. Uh, and the manual will need updating to address these new issues or new requirements, I should have really said. Point one, there are certain expectations. There is one additional expectation, which is G, which covers the need to take cognizance of regulatory requirement. And the point two, improvements to processes will be based on objective measurements, tying in, in the objective with the process improvement. I apologise for having a bit of a runny nose. I've got a bit of a cold today. Expansion and non-applicability. You now have the option to exclude other parts of clauses 6 and 8, not just clause 7. But you have to document your rationale behind each of the reasons why you propose to uh, exclude include a particular requirement. There are changes to the definitions. This will require the creation of a glossary of terms in your quality manual or updating of your definitions in line with these proposed changes. The changes are as follows. The supply chain explanation has been removed and there have been a number of added definitions, which are clinical evaluation, distributor, life cycle, manufacturer, post-market surveillance, performance evaluation, preclinical evaluation, risk, and risk management. And there's a couple being modified. The definition of an active medical device, what a complaint is, labeling, that's the modifications. There's a change in the regulatory authority where the management representative will be responsible for handling regulatory affairs. This responsibility and authority must be documented along with the associated competencies. This may change the role of the qualified person if there are two functions existing within the company. The main changes to record keeping, there will be risk-based management re uh, records and evidence of meeting the regulatory requirements. In later slides, we will see the impacts in greater detail. Now, 415 gives you the general requirements. When you outsource processes, the standard requires that you look at the controls that are going to be put in place for that supplier from a risk perspective. Examples of the things that need addressing are what happens if the supplier doesn't meet the specifications you provided, how will that affect your production cycle, or anything that's related to that component. The proposed standard will require organisations to consider those things ahead of time so that they have controls in place to mitigate the risk as soon as possible. Software validation. 
A standard will require validation of all computer software that is used as part of the quality system. While it has never been a requirement of ISO 13485, software validation has long been discussed in the industry. For example, questions arise like, what if you use an Excel spreadsheet to control a process? Do you have to validate that spreadsheet? Sometimes organizations don't even know where to begin with software validation, what to, what to validate and how to validate it. Under those revisions, <coughs> computer software can be used for, but it's not limited to product design, testing, production, labeling, distribution, inventory control, data management, complaint handling, equipment calibration and maintenance, and corrective and preventive action. If software involves or affects the quality management system, you need to validate. Plus, you need to have a very specific justification on how you validated that software, keeping records associated with what you did, and dem sorry, demonstrating that the software is doing what it's supposed to. This validation also applies when changes or updates are made to the software. There's a note. The note provides guidance on the areas that are involved in the validation process. <coughs> Any <coughs> outsourced process must have a risk assessment done on the supplier's ability to produce. This is just this is not just an assessment of the initial sample or a batch, but their ongoing ability to supply over time. There is a list of items A to Z, which is not exhaustive and can be used as a guidance as applicable to meet the regulatory requirements. At least 26 elements that ISO expects manufacturers to keep as part of the file including product description, drawings, specifications, procedures, packaging instructions, instructions for use, labeling, clinical data. This technical file concept is not new, but the standard now will specifically require you to have it. In the past, this was addressed through relevant medical device directive, but is now made explicit in ISO 13485. Outsource processes, any outsource process must have a risk assessment done on the supplier's ability to produce. This is not just an assessment of the initial result, but an ongoing ability to apply over time, which I said in the previous slide, but I'm just reinforcing it. And under the documentation requirements, another addition is the requirement to keep a file for the device that you're manufacturing, basically a technical file. In the past, this was addressed through the Medical de Device Directive, but has been added as part of 13485. Again, it lists the 26 elements have to keep as part of the file, and, and they're just repeating the technical file. I've just said that already, so I'll just repeat that again. Um, so we'll go on to the next one. Where, for example, data is captured and sent over the internet and also maintained in medical centers, it will have to protect, be protected from hacking and theft. This is not a change, but a personal observation of mine is all too often quality policies are cribbed from the internet and do not reflect the values and the ethics of the company. The top team should all be involved with putting the quality policy together as that is the core of the quality management system. Also, they should all approve it, not just get the quality manager the right one and then get the MD to sign it and date it. It is a key document and should be regularly reviewed to ensure that it still meets with the values and ethics the company has. It is also important to test the understanding by employ employees on how the quality policy impacts on their jobs and their contribution to ensuring the policy is adhered to. All too often, as I say, a fancy words that have no resonance to the rank and file employee, never mind the management team. And under 5.4.2, quality management system planning, 
This section contains a note clarifying what quality system planning normally includes, namely quality objectives, consistent policy, action items to accomplish objectives, monitoring progress and revision. Quality management system planning. There is a note clarifying what quality system planning is and includes quality objectives that are consistent with the quality policy. You will require to demonstrate action on items to accomplish those objectives, monitoring their progress and review and update them in a timely manner. This clause has been expanded to include all staff rather than the narrow definition of those affecting quality. It seeks to clarify how those specific individuals are nominated as being responsible for monitoring of the product and excuse me, also for post-production activities. If we accept the pre quality is everybody's business, then we must broaden our thinking to include everybody, not the, those directly associated just with quality. It is to get away from the thinking of, we make it, you check it. The role of QC increasingly is becoming a production responsibility with the quality department taking the role of quality assurance. This will have the knock-on effect on, on the defining along with the demonstration of competence levels. You're going to be required to determine what kinds of skills and their levels that will be needed by personnel and what responsibilities and authorities they will need to have. The management representative will require to have the knowledge to deal with regulatory bodies along with other external bodies. This is not just a point of contact. This is back to the point I was speaking about earlier about uh, the, the qualified person and the quality manager, the two separate rules. And the next one is that under ISO 9001 no management representative is required. Unlike the 9001 standard, which does not require a management representative, the intention is to broaden the responsibilities and authority for quality across the management team in the 9001, whereas in this standard it's sticking to have an, a management representative and possibly brought in the role to cover regulatory matters. So there's a different emphasis in, in there entirely. There's a lot of discussion around how often management reviews should take place in standards in general. This is often interpreted as covering the whole standard over a three-year period, doing a minimum amount of reporting. Myself, I take the viewpoint that it should be done every quarter. My thinking is, if the financial performance is reported quality, which is standard practice, then the quality management system performance should be reported every quarter. This is an additional source of data to manage the business around. The broader base and sources you take the data from will result in better quality decision making to manage the business around. You can compare apples with apples and if the financial indicators vary from the quality data it should be investigated, especially as the financial reports are all lagging indicators, i.e. how we performed over the previous three months. Now the frequency rationale if you're going to say, I'm going to, to have them once a year, then you have to explain the logic behind your thinking of why you consider this framework is appropriate to your organization. And the risk based approach, again we see the emphasis on risk assessment, both from the documentation and training standpoint. The header in the table 2003, there is no contextual difference between the 2003 and 20, 2012 standards. The only main change was alignment with the EU medical device directives. The 
outputs from the management view will only be effective if the data is recorded correctly in the first place. If the culture of the organisation is a blame one, then the issues will be covered up and not recorded, so there is nothing to analyse or report on. The culture in the organisation need to be that errors are an opportunity to improve, not be used as for apportionment of blame. And 5.6.3, the output, the disk states that outputs of the management review shall include improvement needed to maintain the suitability and adequacy of the quality management system and its processes. The current standard only requires improvement to maintain effectiveness of the quality management system and its process. The current, that's fine, that's that covered. Human resources. The emphasis is broadened to include all personnel performing work like quality, safety or effectiveness to be competent. The draft now breaks down the type of personnel to which this refers. For example, it is very specific, specific about personnel who are involved with fulfilling process requirements, regulatory requirements and quality system compliance. It also requires the organisation to, define what, to sorry, define what education, skills and training those individuals need to have to perform their role. If we accept the premise that everybody is responsible for, rather than having the mindset we make it you inspect that, there's a general sentence now that production and personnel will be responsible for the QC function and the traditional quality department having responsible for quality assurance. This breaks down the make it inspect it mentality which was introduced when mass manufacturing started at the beginning of the industrial revolution. Before that, quality was built into the product by the artisan who made it. He had a pride in his work. Current thinking is self-management teams who collectively take responsible for the product's quality. There is no requirement to check the effectiveness of any training undertaken, whether internal or external. The organisation will have a methodology to evaluate if the effectiveness of the training is commensurate with the risks associated with the work that the individual is performing. Keeping a record to say they have been trained will no longer be acceptable in its own right. Now you need to conduct a risk assessment. Some of the questions to be answered during the risk assessment are, what happens if the training was not clear enough? What are the resulting consequences? What mitigation activities do we have in place to prevent mistakes from happening? Plan maintenance now a consideration we must take into account. This is similar to the old QS 9001 for the automotive industry. You will need to have a very clearly documented procedures that specify how those activities are being performed the planning maintenance intervals and have records to demonstrate what maintenance activities have occurred. The order handling method, this clause also now requires you consider, to consider ways for ensuring that you handle orders in a way so as to present, prevent mix-ups affecting the product supply chain. And now information security is being viewed as infrastructure, which was not the case in the current version of 13485. Information security is something that can affect the quality of your product. So you need to have procedures in place and train your personnel to manage those activities. The last part under Section 6 deals with the work environment. A lot of stress has been placed on cleanliness and monitoring within clean rooms and manufacturing areas that deal with sterilised products to ensure that monitoring for particles is carried out that could have an adverse effect on the product. They refer in ISO 14644, the standard used for controlled environments, as guidance for medical device companies to use in managing clean rooms. This clause contains more clarity about what is meant by the term work environment. 
which is always difficult to define exactly where the boundaries were. Examples are provided on conditions to be considered such as noise, temperature, humidity, lighting, weather and areas of the infrastructure such as inspection areas, distribution areas, but it can be any area within the organization that is, deal, that is dealing with manufactured products. There is now a subclause in sterile medical devices. The standard requires that you take additional measures for these types of products, where there is a need to prevent contamination with particular matter or microorganisms and maintain the level of cleanliness during the assembly and packaging operations. Here again, there is an increased focus on risk management. One of the biggest changes to section 7.1 is the requirement to document how the risk management activities are being handled for product planning. The draft guidance highlights several areas where risk management should be incorporated. Verification, validation, revalidation, monitoring, testing and traceability. You will need to conduct an assessment considering the risks as as you're planning for those activities and that the process has been documented. A note was also added requesting organizations to look at IEC 62304, which is guidance related to software lifecycle processes. If your device incorporates software, then the guidance requires you to look at the different life cycles of that software, so you're planning ahead of time for future changes. The word risk appears 19 times throughout the standard. This shows a new emphasis whereby risk management is the key approach. The, the determining of the requirements relate to the product. The main elements that change in this section, which is under 7.2, customer related processes, is the addition of a requirement to determine user training to ensure that a product will be used in a safe an effective manner. By user, it means the physician or the person who will install the device. While training is sometimes taken into account by manufacturers, it is not always done consistently. This change seeks to ensure that the training process gets firmed up and that there are more controls in place when it comes to training. And the customer information protection this new section under 721 has a requirement that organizations protect confidential health information from their customers. This information could arrive in two ways. It could be customer provided feedback for the organization to incorporate into the requirements for making a product or, a, or it could be post-market surveillance data. Any kind of information that comes from the customers need to protect, be protected in a confidential manner. Now this new clause about documented arrangements must be in place for communicating with regulatory authorities regarding the following four areas. Product information, regulatory inquiries, complaints and advisory notices. There must be a documented procedure how you intend handling these communications. Now that's as far as I want to go today and I'll start on 30, slide 30 next week which is design and development planning. So once again I thank you very much for your time and as has already been said uh, my email address is d, sorry, d smart18 at yahoo.co.uk if either send them into PCB as, a, as an email or send them direct to me uh, any questions you've got today or hold them over till next week where we'll be able to open it right up to everybody and, and 
the kind of questions will not just be relevant to one person, so we can share the information with everybody. So once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, David, for this informative presentation. I want to thank all the attendees as well for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. To keep up with our webinars, please check PECB's webinar schedule in our website, www.pecb.com, or our official social media network. And don't miss ISO 13485 Proposed Changes Part 2 next Wednesday. And don't forget to bring your questions with you because we will be more than happy to answer to all of your questions then. See you then and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, David. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Part 2 of ISO 13485 Proposed Changes. Happy to have you all here again. I am Arta Lamani, the PECB organizer of this webinar, and the guest for today is David Smart, PECB Certified Trainer and Managing Director of Smart ISO System Smart Mentoring. Today, please feel free to write your questions and comments in the question box in the right-hand control panel, or you can use the raise hand function. We will unmute you, and you will have a chance to ask the questions directly. David will answer to all questions accordingly at the end of the presentation. Please, David, you may start the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we did the first part of the presentation I want to begin now, as you can see, with design and development planning. So we'll get on to that. And you'll see we have three um, um, headers up there. This is your standard requirement that you now require to document your planning. In previous versions, it was mandated that you plan design and development related activities. But this revision insists upon a more robust approach to document these activities. Another addition to the subclause requires that you have a process in place to ensure traceability of your design and development outputs to the design and development inputs. In addition, you need to look at the resources that you will need for design and development stages, including the competence of the personnel who will be involved in those activities. Evaluation of the personnel conducting the design activities must be demonstrable not just appoint someone without the appropriate background. There's now a new note that clarifies that design and development review, verification and validation have distinct purposes and can be conducted and recorded separately or in any combination that is suitable for the product and the organization. The verification activities. There is more emphasis on this clause on developing a documented process for planning the design and development verification activities. It also specifically indicates that verification plans should cover the acceptance criteria and sample sizes utilized in the design, along with the rationale behind the selection of them. If the intended use requires the device to be connected to other devices, then the design verification activities must confirm that the design outputs still meet the design inputs when connected. You have to evaluate at the verification, that's check and validation, which is to prove stages, not just the design itself, sorry, the device itself, but how it performs with other devices or systems. The question you need to ask is, will the design continue to do what it's supposed to do once it's connected to another device or another system? This new clause requires a documented plan for your design transfer. If you're going to transfer it from your own facilities to another facilities or an outsourcing partner, you must ensure that your design and development outputs are suitable for the production specifications. In other words, if you move your product, will the site be able to use your specs and manufacture the products in the same way you do at your existing site? Can this be demonstrated with objective evidence to support your product? There are eight aspects that organization needs to consider. First one is, 
supplier quality and capability. Next one, manufacturing personnel, capability and planning. Next one, manufacturing process and process validation. The materials, manufacturing tools and methods, the manufacturing environment, the installation and the service. You need to have a process in place that explains how each of these items will be addressed if you transfer the design to another supplier. Records. <clears throat> Again, a new clause added. This explains the type of record you need to keep in a file as part of your design and development activities. Previously, it was up to the manufacturer to decide how they were going to manage their records and provide evidence that the device was meeting all of the requirements. Now this draft standard is very prescriptive about the types of documentation required to keep in the file. Examples, results of preclinical trials relating to the device and its conformance with its specifications. Biocompatibility studies, EMC, electrical safety and electromagnetic capability software validation and verification, reports on the clinical evaluation, and the last one, the post-market clinical follow-up plan and evaluation report. While manufacturers require to keep a file, they may determine what is important to include in their file so, so they have the records available. For example, biocompatibility might not be applicable to all devices, so it will not appear in every device's file. This clause clarifies the type of criteria to consider before approving a supplier. You need to have a plan on how you will select suppliers, how you will evaluate, re-evaluate, and then approve them based on their ability to meet your requirements. Yet again, we see an emphasis on risk analysis. You will be required to demonstrate whether you have strict controls depending on how important the vendor's products are to your manufacturing operations. In cases where the product is extremely important, you will possibly want to audit those suppliers more frequently, requiring them to be ISO 13485 certified and have periodic meetings to assess how they are performing. If, on the other hand, the supplier is not as critical, you might not be so stringent. The expectation is that you show you have performed a risk assessment to justify requirements for all of your critical suppliers. <coughs> Monitoring your suppliers. Organizations must demonstrate that they are checking in on how their suppliers are performing and are utilizing that data as part of the re-evaluation process. If your suppliers not meeting your requirements, you have to show what you're doing to help the supplier improve their performance, or that you're disqualifying them, or that you're engaging in other activities that take into account that's taken into account when you're doing your risk assessment. You need to have evidence that you are reviewing the data. Following up from, from 7.4.1.2, this new requirement requires you to keep records of your supplier evaluations, including any actions taken as a result of these evaluations. Again, supplier information. This is a new requirement requiring that you have to have quality agreements with your suppliers. If, as an example, a supplier makes a change related to your product or deviates away from the original plan, then there are very specific rules and responsibilities that need to take place. The supplier needs to communicate with you these amendments to your contracts. Suppliers can't simply change something without letting you know. This is not a new concept. But now the draft standard requires us to be documented and communicated to you from your suppliers. There's now an added requirement to include, to include procedures for validation of sterilization and packaging. If you comply with the European Medical Device Directive, you will be already doing this. 
now the new proposed standard is going to call for it. There's also an added reference to ISO 11607 standard for packaging, thermally sterilized medical devices. This is just another reference you can use as guidance to help you comply with the 13485 requirements. Another new subclause 75.3.1 states that there must be a unique device identification, a UDI, that is required by the regulatory agency in a country where you sell your product. You need to establish and maintain a unique uh, a UDI for your device. This is probably uh, a, a FDA driven clause since the FDA recently implemented UDI rules in the US. But as it becomes a more established practice, additional regulatory bodies will start asking for UDIs. It is also important to point out that the subclause requires that your procedures in place to separate and distinguish return products from conforming ones. If, for example, you receive returns from a hospital or a distribution center, you need to prevent that product from getting mixed up with your existing or these products you get mixed up with your existing products. Customer property. The standard requires that you to look at the regulatory requirements from all countries in which you must preserve confidential health information. If confidentiality is a requirement in that country where your product is sold, you need to have a procedure to address how you safeguard confidential information and treat it as customer property. 7.5.5, the preservation of the product. This new section instructs you to evaluate your packaging and shipping containers to ensure that they are designed to protect the device from contamination and damage, not only during the processing of the device, but also during handling, storage and distribution. It forces you to look at the complete life cycle for that package and perform the necessary validations. For example, if you plan to ship your devices to a region that is extremely cold, do you know that your package will be able to protect the product? Or is the product going to freeze, resulting in an adverse effect? The same thing goes for high temperatures or other environmental factors. You have to take into account as you perform your validation. Potential requirements for sterile medical medical devices, this is again a new requirement that elaborates on particular requirements for sterile medical devices. If you manufacture sterile product, you have to take additional measures to make sure that the st sterility will be preserved. Whatever you plan to ship and however long it takes you to get there, some questions to ask is, how do you demonstrate that the product is going to remain sterile? Again, you need to have the validation records to prove that your product meets this requirement. 8.2.1 feedback. What has changed here is that the draft standard requires organizations to come up with documented processes for gathering data from production and post-production activities. While the current standard makes general references, this is now more specific or explicit, stating that you have to gather feedback and provide guidance on how to do so. The draft standard is more prescriptive about documenting how you gather this data. Not only will you be required to gather feedback, but also to incorporate as part of your risk management program. Any data you obtain becomes inputs to your risk management process to help you determine what effects the feedback will have on the product and whether any changes are required within your design or production activities to address these concerns. In addition, you will have to evaluate that data using some kind of statistical methodology. Each organization will have to decide what method makes the most sense based on your product and your processes and activities. If you aren't using any statistical methods, then you have to provide the rationale 
justifying why you have chosen not to. Once you have the analysis, then you'll need to determine if that needs to go into your corrective and prevention, your CAPA process. If the notified body starts seeing trends and issues and does not raise any CAPAs related to them, then this will become an issue. They want to make sure that you are really acting upon feedback, not just reviewing it. The last change relates to regulatory requirements, something we have seen across the draft. It asks organizations to look beyond their local requirements to all international regulations that apply to your product, especially relating to post-market activities. Certain countries have very unique requirements regarding conducting and handling the data from post-market activities, so you have to make sure that is incorporated in your policies. Want to measure your processes. This clause has an added no about the type and extent of monitoring measurement appropriate to each process and its impact on the conformity to product requirements and on the effectiveness of the quality system. Organizations need to determine the best way to monitor their processes depending on their environment and process complexity. For example, if you are analyzing production data and you find there's an issue with calibration, the action you take might be different than if you are evaluating data from your post-market activities or your preventive maintenance system. The calibration monitoring tool used in process might be different from the calibration monitoring tool used for final inspection for releasing your product. You will require to be able to justify how tight your controls are based on the circumstances and the complexity of each process. This clause now includes a note that states, records shall identify the test equipment used to perform measurement activities and the personnel authorizing release of the product. Every batch manufactured will require you to demonstrate what equipment was used. So if 10, for example, so if 10 measuring gauges have been used in the process, then you need to be able to trace them down to which one you used to measure some aspect of the device before its final release. Not only do you have to trace it back to the instrument, you have to show who in your organization authorized the approval. It is also important to mention that this was brought up with the latest revision of ISO 14971, the risk management standard. Now ISO is trying uh, put, sorry, I'll start again. Now ISO is tying it in with this section in ISO 13485 so that it is consistent across the standards. Clause 8.3 of the draft guidance has been broken down into several different subsections, the first of which is 8.3.1. This clause requires that the evaluation of non-conformance includes the determination of the need to investigate. You need to show how an issue was investigated and how you notified all the stakeholders involved in the investigation and were associated with the non-conformity. There is now also a link between the nonconformity and the CARPA system, corrective action and preventive action. You will require to be able to show if the issue warranted a CARPA or if it, <coughs> or if it is just managed within the system itself. Obviously, you would have to justify why you decided to not escalate into CARPA versus just leaving that within the nonconformist management system. This clause discusses the acts required to handle the nonconformities before the product is shipped out of your facility. If you identify the nonconformities before the product leaves the plant, it provides an outline of all actions that must be completed before you release the product. As an example, you will need to make sure you eliminate the nonconformity, document your criteria for releasing it, ensure the product meets all of its specifications and have addressed the relevant regulatory requirements that other countries may have imposed. 
This clause is similar to 832, except that it applies to nonconformities identified after a product has been released. Organizations need to have a documented procedure for issuing and implementing, implementing an advisory notice. Again, this clause is no new. Rework was already included in the current standard as part of the control of nonconforming products. However, in this new section that's been added, it states that if you establish rework, you need to look at any potential adverse effects on the product. Not only that, but it also has to become part of your risk management process. When you decide that a product needs to be reworked, you were required to also consider the implications excuse me, and request <coughs> um, retest has to be done on the product. How does the rework affect the design of the product or any other manufacturing? Again, very what was new here, a uh, specific clause to make sure you keep all the records associated with your management and nonconformities. These records would include any decisions, people involved, and authorizations that took place before the product was released. <coughs> 8.4 analysis of data. This clause requires that you gather data to demonstrate that your quality system is suitable and effective, you're making improvements, and that you're taking actions. The standard is all about making sure that you have a solid system in place that is continually evolving. Two requirements were added to this section. The first is audits. You need to look at your data from audits to determine if you're having more issues in a given area that could potentially become a larger problem. The draft guidance doesn't specify the types of audit, but you can assume this also covers supplier audits. The second new requirement is to review data from service reports. So if you manufacture a device in which you will perform a service, you have to review the data looking for potential issues. The example might be if your product is an implantable device, then most likely this requirement wouldn't apply to you. But if you make capital equipment, you will need to have data that shows that service activities you are engaged in and analysis on how the data is behaving. 8.5.2 Improvement, a subclause is added that requires you to come up with a corrective action plan that is commensurate with the risk. Depending on the risk of the, <coughs> of the problem you experience, you will need to establish why you've decided to give one way or another with your response to it. The other thing that's been added was two requirements that organizations need to address in a documented procedure. The first one is reviewing the product and process data analysis to identify nonconformities for corrective action. This is just time back to what we covered earlier in a previous slide under control of nonconforming product. The other one is determining and implementing the action needed, included where appropriate, updating of the documentation. Finally, there is a comment about analyzing your corrective actions as part of your management review process. This is not a, something new, but a line has been added to make sure that you need to have feedback included as part of your management review process. The changes to this clause are similar to the previous clause in corrective action. There is a requirement that you review the product and the process data analysis to identify potential nonconformities to in order to prevent their occurrence. At the end of the paragraph, there is the same request that analysis of preventive actions should provide feedback to the management review process. So if I can end now with a summary of what I've covered over the two days I did the full presentation. The first one is the regulatory requirements. The first section, 0 0.1, establish an emphasis on regulatory requirements, which we see across the rest of the draft standard. This includes not only the local requirements that apply at your facility, but if you're an organization that commercializes its products globally, 
you also need to create into consideration the relevant international requirements. There are many references to this throughout the draft standard. The second bullet point there is risk management. Another thing that permeates the draft standard is the need to incorporate risk management into all the main quality processes within your organization. Almost everything you do needs to be based on that risk. Justifying that what you're doing is adequate and conforms to what you defined as part of your design and production activities. Validation, verification and design transfer. The draft standard puts a lot more structure into place around those activities. You must now have plans in place and documented evidence to show you have done validation, verification and the design transfer activities. And the fourth point, outsource processes. The draft standard requires that organizations do a lot more when it comes to outsourcing processes and put in a place control for assessing suppliers, again based on risk. And the final point is feedback. The draft requires you to monitor and measure the performance of your quality management system, not only during production, but also post-market activities. You also have to incorporate those activities as part of your risk management process. The linkage between the different clauses within the standard has been improved. Now everything is more interconnected, more joined up. You have to have systems in place that allow you to demonstrate conformance across the requirements. It's a much more integrated approach. And that concludes my presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody for uh, bearing with me over the two days I did the pre presentation. Now, if, if you have typed in um, any questions, I can keep them now. And I, I would like them probably read out to me, or you, the the microphone can, can be opened up to you to ask the question. Either way is fine, so I'll hand it back now, and then we can open it up to uh, questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this presentation. Now, with the time left, as David said, we will go ahead with questions. Therefore, if you have any questions, it's time to ask them. Please use the comment box or your raise hand function. Thank you, and we will go ahead and uh, read out your questions. The first question here, David, is what, what is the standard trying to achieve with the revisions? It's trying to fall in line with the way the medical device directives are moving. And it's also much more risk-based now and documenting it down rather than just sort of being lip service to it. You're required to demonstrate it's a regulated industry. I find a big difference in attitude in a regulated industry that's got 13485 as opposed to say a manufacturing that's going for ISO 9000 is a much more lax attitude. You've got to meet regulatory requirements, it's people's lives you're dealing with, it's risk based approach, so it's very much trying to get the point across about the products you're supplying are fit for purpose. Thank you. The next question is, how will these new changes improve quality in the final product or medical devices? Well, in that sense, it shouldn't really make any difference. I mean, what we're talking about is good practices. And in the current standard, there were always implied about continual improvement and you should always be supplying good product, always on a never ending journey to improve your processes, methods, your customer service levels, uh, the whole gambit. You're trying to be more efficient as a company to, to show you know be a market leader, etc. So from that point of view, uh, it's not just about regulatory requirements. It's not just about what I've got to do because it, there's a law uh, forcing you to do it. Uh, it's very much doing it because you want to do it 
and on a never-end journey, we talk about zero defects as an example. We know we'll never achieve it, but we're always trying to continually improve our systems, either through technology or if, if new legislation comes out or new managers come, come in, new ideas. It's about harnessing the latent skills within the, the company and really buying into what your quality management system is about and people feeling involved rather than saying, I don't really understand what this is all about. Uh, the, the people at the grassroots should understand how their contribution fits in, tying in with the operational issues, operational plan, with the strategic direction of the company. Thank you. The next question is, when monitoring your suppliers, give examples in your experience how to communicate more often with suppliers without having, without having to document too much information. Often the question comes up, and I'm just facing it at this very moment, about too much paperwork in here. We do nothing else but document something down. Now, for me, it's very much about getting facts together. And you would want that information to manage the business around. You want to know how your suppliers are doing. I mean, in a, in a, without um, the next one I'm going to do, the next um, one of these I'm going to do is actually on supplier sustainability. <coughs> And you'll see how you want to measure your suppliers, and you want to know that they're there and continue to provide you with a good product. I mean, it's not unusual for, for a, a management team to change and the product quality to go down the swanee, or if the company starts having difficulties, they start financial difficulties, they may well start trying to cut corners and buy cheaper products. And, no do so many tests, etc., etc. So uh, it's very much about supply chain management. You're only as strong as, as your weakest link. And the old um, adage about having three suppliers and playing them all off against one another is very much outdated. And it's about a supplier recognizing that and you recognize them as a company and your customers, these are the three main links. Obviously, you've got upstream suppliers and downstream suppliers from them, but the three main links in the chain, it's in your common interest to form close bonds so that mutual survival and growth for everybody is the same. And it's about understanding your suppliers and getting the necessary, them supplying you and them understanding why you need the data not just about gathering a load of data, like, I mean, I go about this all the time, asking them if they've got a quality policy, um, do you have a, a an ISO 13485 system? Uh, many, many times in my experience, I've been asked to fill, fill supplier questionnaires out, I've not done it. The buyer phones me up and says, why you no filled it out? Uh, and I said, well, let me ask you the question, what do you do with that? And the guy says, nothing, I throw it in a drawer, but we need it because it's for the ISO system. And I say, no, no, that's rubbish. For instance, you want to know how many deliveries are on time. You might want to know the test specifications of what product was tested against, sent with a batch. Lots and lots of information. It's about determining, I often talk about, starting at the front end and determining critical success factors with your customers, five or six key facts, then coming inside the organization and developing key performance indicators to match the critical success factors. That in turn leads down the line, incoming products, I mean the ideal scenario has to be uh, do any inspection and testing at source, no, uh, wait till it comes in the door, and then have to check it. Um, these days, again, there should not be really be any backdoor inspection, but because it's so critical, um, and sometimes you've got key support sources that you can only get from somewhere and they know it, 
and charge you the earth and then they deliver on time or part deliver it and mess you about all sorts of ways that you have to live through. So hopefully that's me. I've gone into a bit of detail there, but I think it's important. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Another question is, in your opinion, in what countries do you think will benefit the most from these new changes or have the most difficulties implementing them? I suppose in a, a sentence, in theory, if we look at the number of registrations in a country against the population size and work it out as a percentage, then we could say that because, for instance, we'll take 5750, which was the first quality standard developed from a, mil a military standard in this country. Uh, of which ISO 9000 grew out of. Um, there's a whole history in there and it's been going a long time. So therefore, it should be well developed. It all depends, I mean, speaking about this country, the UK in particular, it's very difficult for the management team to see what qualities got to do with things and how they um, they don't really understand it and often there's battles go on with financial departments and, and they want to control and report on how um, companies are performing and I often get into huge debates about uh, sources of information now, your quality management system should be reported at your management review. Now, what I try and get across is to get away from a financial model and take evidence from a wider base. The more sources you take data from, the more accurately you're liable to uh, be sure that for when you're making decisions and running a company, which is the whole point in this quality system, is to provide data, analyze it, crunch it, come up with information to manage your business around so that it complements or doesn't complement the financial model. And again, we talk about doing management reviews every year and then they want to do them and on and on. And I say, well, it's an accepted practice that you do financial reporting and every month you do financial, you do ratio analysis, you report the business performance every quarter. Why not report the performance of your quality system on the same basis? And it seems to be an alien culture. So what I'm saying is you've got indicators in your financial performance, you've got indicators in your quality management system performance. If they're telling you different things or they're telling you the same thing, that complement the financial indicators, which tend to be lagging indicators, where you more want to move towards leading indicators on the time frame, it's not really helpful to say, well, how did we perform in the last three months? That's historic. We want to know, in as close as possible, how are we performing now? And with big data and all that, and developing the software packages, relational databases, there's hundreds of things you can do to manage your business and why we struggle as a, as a profession to make a contribution into an organization. Um, I can only come to the conclusion that often we talk too technically and it's how to get the message across at grassroots level. Uh, again, it's a power struggle as well often. Um, I often feel it's easier to make your mark as a production manager than a quality manager. And Anyway, I'm getting on my soapbox. I hope that's answered your question. Thank you, David. The last question is, mm, the new standard, will the new standard require competence, training, and aquar uh, um, awareness, sorry, with, within the organization? Meaning, meaning the new changes. Are, they, are there going to need to be trainings and awareness classes within the organization? There's two ways to look at it. 
if your system's well developed and mature, and you're doing, as I said throughout the presentation, the current standard says it, implies it, so you should be doing the best practices anyway. All it's done now is align more with the medical device standards, and the, it makes it clearer, or tries to make it clearer, what you've got to do. So it's like a guidebook that you should be doing. So, on the one hand, I can turn around and say, well, best practices were getting done anyway, so there shouldn't be a lot of work excuse me, to be done. But on the other hand, because of what I said in the previous question about the poor understanding of quality in an organization, um, and you should be doing it because you want to do it because of the internal benefits and savings to the bottom line within the business, no be driven by legislation to say we have to do this because we have to protect ourselves from litigation. So that's my take on it from both sides. Thank you again, David, for this very informative presentation. Uh, because of the time limited, we will have to conclude this presentation. However, if you have any other questions, you can send your questions through email and we will answer to them individually. I want to thank all the attendees as well for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. To keep up with our webinars, please check PECB's webinar schedule on our website, PECB.com, or our official social media network to be informed on next year's third round webinars. On that note, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Enjoy and thank you again, everyone. And David, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Same sentiment. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.